Hello dear friends of Inside Opera and Classical Music and welcome to a new video. We are in the Lent period and we couldn't miss a video dedicated to the music of this period. So we will talk about the wonderful Stabat Mater by Giovanni Battista Pergolesi, which tells the sufferings of Mary during the crucifixion of Jesus. But first, Subscribe to the channel if you haven't done so yet. It's a small gesture that costs you nothing, but that is essential for the channel growth. Done? Well, let's go. Giovanni Battista Draghi, known as Pergolesi, was a composer, organist and violinist. He was born in Jesi, in the Marche region, in Italy, but he studied in Naples at the Conservatory of the Poor of Jesus Christ, and from there he began his musical career. For this reason he is remembered as an adopted son of Naples and counted among the leading exponents of the Neapolitan music school of the Baroque era. He composed between 1731 and 1736, a short time for such a promising young man who unfortunately died very young at only 26 years old. Pergolesi probably began to compose the Stabat Mater in 1734, the year following his other best-known composition, the Intermezzo, La Serva Padrona, but he finished it only two years later. This composition was commissioned by the lay Neapolitan confraternity of the Knights of the Virgin of Sorrows of St. Louis at the palace, to be able to perform it during the celebration of Holy Week. A lay confraternity was a sort of association of faithful people of the Catholic Church who promoted the spread of the cult. These confraternities, especially in Naples, were very important and their Easter celebrations were by far the most popular. This was a once-in-a-lifetime occasion, especially as this Stabat Mater would replace that of Alessandro Scarlatti, which had already been performed for many years in a row, and the confraternity desired a new composition with a more modern taste. Pergolesi, between 1734 and 1735, was a rising talent. He was very young, very talented, and collected many successes, but also some failures. He was mainly busy composing for the theatre, but the opportunity presented to him to replace a composition by Scarlatti was really a unique opportunity to demonstrate his qualities. In addition, the confraternity that commissioned the work, it seems that had already paid for it, for the sum of 10 ducats. To make you understand what amount it is, I searched through historical converters and it is more or less between 200 and 170 euros. To make his work more difficult, there were also serious health problems, which had been present for years, but which gradually got worse. In fact, Pergolesi fell ill with tuberculosis. His conditions worsened, and at the beginning of 1736, thanks to the protection of the Duke of Maddaloni, he decided to stay outside Naples, in Pozzuoli, at the convent of St. Francis, to find a calm and relaxed environment where he could recover, thanks also to the good sea air. However, Pergolese wouldn't stay in such a tranquility or couldn't. He was only 26 years old, wanted to write music and despite his conditions, he did it. A Salve Regina and the Stabat Mater date back to this period. Pergolesi found himself to set to music the verses of Stabat, the verses of the 13th century attributed to Jacopone da Todi, verses that before him had already been the verses of the great composers of his past, from Palestrina to Vivaldi. Pergolesi chose to follow the style that Scarlatti used in the Stabat, using two solo voices of soprano and alto, and also a similar instrumentation with two violins, a viola and basso continuo. Following the taste of the time, he divided the verses into duets and solo arias, creating 12 wonderful musical pieces. 
However, Pergolesi, unlike Scarlatti, opted for a more intimate and concise composition, shorter, but at the same time extremely emotional and incisive. It was a very modern composition for the time. In fact, Pergolesi used all the musical trends of the period, from both the Neapolitan and the European schools. Thus, we find a poignant game of delays from the first notes of the vocal line. Doesn't it feel like these notes are trying to touch each other, like trying to connect? As if Mary and Jesus were trying to embrace each other, they couldn't do it, but they couldn't even break away. Less innovative because of the 17th century tradition, but the use of the basso continuo as a lamentation is also very effective, with this descending figuration that uh, doesn't it remind you of tears? there is also a certain theatrical part that we can hear in the suspensions. And also some real sighs. cries of pain. Pergolesi remained faithful to the form used in the sacred musical tradition, but this renewal is centered above all on the great pathos that reveals note after note. It is not a stabat of composure, like that of Scarlatti, it is a stabat of pain, imbued with almost theatrical drama. And it is precisely this characteristic, together with its shocking beauty, that made it one of the most important compositions of the Italian 18th century. The passion here is lived in the first person by the Mother of Christ. It is like seeing her pain under the light of a spotlight as if every word came directly out of her lips. The pain of seeing the suffering of her child, to the point of feeling every pain on herself, creates an incredibly strong identification. An identification that Pergolesi certainly felt about himself because of his situation. We can imagine him writing the song of Mary grieving for the death of his son, working day and night between one cough and another, while he himself was dying. As you can see from the manuscript, Pergolesi was in a hurry to finish, probably for fear of not being able to finish it. So we find some errors in the part of the viola, or small parts missing, but only sketched, and a bit of general disorder that can be easily translated as haste. Perhaps the haste came from the approach of Lent, and therefore also from the deadline of the commission, or it was because he felt he did not have much time left, and that last composition could be the last, and therefore be in all respects his spiritual testament. Legend has it that he died the same day he finished writing it, on March 16th, 1736, after having written the last words, Finis Laus Deo, a thank you to God for giving him the time to finish it.
he was buried in a mass grave, a sad fate that unfortunately fell not only to him, but also to other great musicians, such as Vivaldi and Mozart. The great diffusion of this work began soon. It was published in London in 1749 and soon became the most printed work of its century. It was so loved that many facts attributed to Pergolesi soon spread, in an attempt by publishers to ride the wave of success to sell more. 600 compositions were thus attributed to him, while today only 148 are by his hand, and 30 of dubious attribution. There are those who loved this Tabat Mater, and there are also those who strongly criticized it, as Abbot Martini, where he probably found too much melodrama, too much opera, too much theatre, and even Berlioz criticized it by defining it as a nightmare music. However, many composers were fascinated by its beauty, and in fact several revisions and versions were made, including those by Paisiello and Salieri, and also a valuable transcription by Alexei Lvov, who was choir master and the Tsar of Russia. He felt the need to enlarge the staff, probably in an attempt to create more sound impact, to satisfy the taste of the Russian court. Thus, we find a score for large orchestra and four voices choir, really very far from the elegance and clarity of the original composition. Another version, certainly equally if not more famous, is the one made by Johann Sebastian Bach, who adapted the Stabat Mater in the psalm Tilge Höchster meine Sünden, with German lyrics, but the music is precisely that of Pergolesi. Some speak of it as a parody, others as a tribute to the talent of the young Pergolesi. I tend to lean more towards the latter, also because it was a practice in use at the time, and moreover, Bach had also copied Vivaldi. Bach obviously liked Italian music. Many other composers loved it. Bellini claimed that he could not play it on the piano without crying. Rossini considered Pergolesi's work sublime and unattainable, and perhaps for this reason he spent a long time before writing his Tabat Mater. However, before ending, an anecdote about Pergolesi's Tabat Mater. Pergolesi was in Naples, already intent on writing the Tabat Mater and probably looking for inspiration. One day, while walking in the center, he was overwhelmed by a crowd that went to Piazza Mercato and was forced to go there. All that crowd was there for a terrible reason, a hanging. At the foot of the gallows there was a woman, her face streaked with tears and sang an ancient melody. She was the mother of the deaf rowing mate. This image of the grieving mother at the foot of the gallows, while she sang, created the perfect inspiration for his Stabat Mater. Unfortunately, we cannot know if this anecdote is true, also because, especially in the 1700s and 1800s, the anecdotes about the composers were particularly in vogue, so we cannot be sure of their veracity. However, true or not, it fully expresses the concept of the mother's real pain for the loss of a child, a pain that goes beyond religion itself, a pain that Pergolesi has masterfully recreated in his notes, and that brings anyone who hears it to him to live those strong emotions, emotions sublimated by the beauty of music. Thank you for watching this video, if you liked, leave a like and a comment, and if you haven't yet done, remember to subscribe to the channel and activate the notification bell so you don't miss the next ones!